Aaron Meyer is the author of the New York Times bestseller, No Rules Rules, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention that she co-wrote with Netflix CEO Reed Hastings. Aaron is also the author of The Culture Map, Breaking Through the Invisible Boundaries of Global Business, and a professor at INSED, one of the world's leading international business schools. In 2019, Aaron was selected by the Thinkers 50 as one of the 50 most influential business thinkers in the world. On this episode, Aaron dives deep into the controversial ideologies at the heart of the Netflix psyche, which have generated results that are the envy of the business world. Drawing on hundreds of interviews with current and past Netflix employees from around the globe and never before told stories of trial and error from Hastings' own career, No Rules Rules is the fascinating and untold account of the philosophy behind one of the world's most innovative, imaginative, and successful companies. Erin, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Nice to be here with you, Sean. I'm great. Awesome. Fantastic. One thing I always love to do and kind of decode and uncover is people who've achieved success and sustain that throughout their career. I'm always interested. Are, are there certain routines you've kept up over the years that you thought brought a lot of value to yourself? Huh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, well, so I'm a writer. I'm a professor at a business school at INSEAD, which is a business school outside of Paris. And then I'm a writer. So I have my first book, The Culture Map, which is about national cultural differences in the workplace. And our second book that we're going to talk about today, No Rules, Rules. Um, so I can tell you some things about writing. Um, so I, when I write, I write every morning. Uh, for a few hours and I found that I have a few hours of like clarity with writing and I can do really good work and then in the early afternoon I get kind of swaggy um, and then in the after late afternoon I think I'm writing really well but if I look at what I've written later it's always crap so uh, I know I shouldn't write from scratch in the afternoon but I can go back and edit so it's actually really, that was really important for me. It took me quite a while to kind of figure out how to use my, my brain power in order to actually uh, make, make that writing, writing efficient. I'd love to know when you discovered that, because I, I think understanding yourself and knowing what times a day, what, what parts of the year you work best is, is really intuitive and it's very helpful long-term. So I'd love to know when you discovered that within yourself. Yeah, I think, um, and I made some other adjustments. I mean, I'm not writing a book now, right? But I made some other adjustments. Like I used to drink a big cup of tea and I know other people drink coffee in the morning, right? And then I would find that after I had written about for about two hours, I'd start to get kind of sleepy. So I stopped drinking a, a cup of tea. I mean, I would only like put a little bit of tea of caffeine in my tea, like just for 30 seconds, right? And then when I came back, I could give it a little bit more of it, the tea bag. Uh, so I could kind of like spread the caffeine of the tea out throughout the morning. Um, I actually don't know when I discovered that. I mean, I think it must have been early on with my first book because uh, when you're writing, managing that freshness in your brain, that becomes everything. And if you're getting tired, I mean, you're not going to get anything. Done, right? can, can you even double click on that, that freshness in the brain and, and having to really tap into that? Yeah. Oh, you want me to talk about where the freshness in the brain comes oh, from? Oh, I, I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I found that uh, in order to be innovative, my brain had to really be free. And actually, that was a very interesting experience writing this, this second book, which I wrote with Reed Hastings from Netflix, which was that I felt a lot of external pressure uh, to do something really good really fast. And because of that, I started asking a lot of people for feedback, which is something that I had not done early on with my first book. And I actually found that getting all that feedback, it, um, it just like, it just put my brain in a box. Like I started worrying, oh, is this good? Is this going to work? And finally, you know, partway through, I, I kind of said, okay, I'm going to stop asking feedback from anybody. I'm just going to give myself permission to try things out. And I remember that I started a new document and I titled it an experiment. And I did that in order to give myself like permission to just try things, even if they didn't work. And then that's the one that ended up turning into the manuscript. So yeah, so what I learned about myself is that to be have fresh thinking, I need to have really clear big periods of time. But beyond that, to feel free of, um, let's say, of pressure, of the, the pressure of judgment of people around me. I think that's where that innovation takes place and that kind of free space. 
it's funny you guys hit on this a lot in the book in terms of what the culture internally at Netflix is like. So I, I'm going to love diving into that. It's so interesting. It's really intriguing though, because one of the things we think a lot about with, within tech companies is that speed, that constant innovation. And it's funny, those quick feedback loops were boxing you in like that. So, so I guess, how do you start balancing that now between receiving those feedback loops, but also giving yourself enough space to really let that creative genius come out? Yeah, well, that's interesting because at Netflix, of course, uh, feedback is part of the principle of, of their of, of being innovative. But I found personally that I needed to know that I was free of judgment when I was coming up with ideas so I could do things that were like kind of on the edge of stupid or on the edge of crazy. Right. Because that's where, re where real innovation lies. Right. Um, and then once I felt like, oh, yeah, I feel pretty good about this then I could go out and get, then I needed to go out and get feedback. And I certainly got very, very important feedback at certain moments, but only, but not when I was trying to innovate at the same time. Yeah, I, I love walking on that tightrope. <laughs> the edge is stupid there. I, I tend to find myself there quite frequently. I, I am wondering though, once you feel like you've given yourself that creative space, what type of feedback are you, are you receiving and, and seeking out? Are, are there certain people in your life that, you, that you've gone to repeatedly? Yeah, well, so each time I write a book, I, I've written a book, I've had people that I really trust who are giving me feedback throughout. Um, and that's why I said I like over feedback on the second one. Um, but I mean, for me, I have some people in my personal life. So my husband, who's also my business partner, I have him read everything first. And that's because he tells me if I've dropped over the edge of stupid. Right? <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you feel like you don't want to want to, um, to display that stuff to people outside of your family until you're sure it's at least OK. Um, so I have him read everything I and mean, he always reads everything. But beyond that, I also I mean, with my second book, once I had a, a, what I felt was a good manuscript, um, I worked with my Harvard Business Review editor, this guy, David Champion, who I'm very close to. And I love David because he's super critical and super direct. Uh, but when he likes something, he's really supportive. And of course, that's what you need. There's no point in having somebody who's going to give you feedback, but then think that everything you do is wonderful, right? What does David do really well? Because you were mentioned that tension there of like providing that, that tough, difficult conversation, that feedback. And I know you talk about this a lot about this within Netflix, but then also being there enough to support. Is that case by case basis and just really knowing who you're giving feedback to? Well, I mean, for me, the big thing about him is that because he's so critical, I know if he something, says something is excellent, that it's really excellent. Yeah. And that's who I always look for to give me feedback. I mean, you can always find people who will love what you've written. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, some people love everything. And those are not the best people to be getting feedback from. Yeah, I've certainly discovered find those people that can be really critical uh, and, and provide the best feedback there instead, instead of just supporting yourself continually. Aaron, I take it you are just a voracious learner and, and, and seem like you're constantly curious. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, I am a voracious learner in my field. So um, since uh, uh, since first graduating from undergrad, which was a long time ago, I mean, I'm, all, I'm almost 50, right? So it's been a while. Um, I um, have been passionate about understanding cultural differences. So my, my first love was national cultures and how people in different parts of the world um, were motivated by different things, felt that some, some feedback was constructive and some destructive, thought that some kind of leadership was, was appropriate and other kinds of appro uh, leadership not appropriate. And how then when people were working in multicultural situations, that if they didn't understand those differences, that they would end up kind of just like, um, well, really, really ending up in a muddle, right? So yeah, I'm very passionate about that. And then I became passionate about corporate culture only as I started working on this book about Netflix. And I have to say up until um, that I learned about the Netflix corporate culture, I actually wasn't very interested in corporate culture. And I think that's because most, uh, most organizations they, they tell you that their corporate culture is one thing, but it's not really what's going on in the company, 
right? And, you know, everyone's talking about integrity and respect and judgment, um, but it doesn't really have a reflection on how people behave. So what I, what I loved about when I came across the Netflix culture was here was a company who told it like it is. Here was a company who dared to take a stand and dared to look at the real like tensions and dilemmas that their employees were, were wrestling with on a daily basis and say, you know what, um, when you come across this dilemma, go this way. Uh, so yeah, that was my first time that I became a fascinated, fascinated with corporate culture, but, uh, but this one definitely fascinated me. Uh, I know you emphasized you really became uh, interested in that. So I'd love to dive in that in a second. But what I loved is the structure of the book, right? A lot of times we'll, we'll read these, these books by CEOs and they're describing everything about how the company is. And you're wondering like, is this actually the case internally? And so the, the structure of the book for anyone who hasn't read it yet, which I, I certainly high, highly recommend, is that Reed would essentially give his take and then you'd chime in along with just in-depth and thorough interviews. So it was, it was a great um, seeing what the CEO was saying and then how accurate that was within the actual culture. W where did that come from? Why did you guys decide to do it that way? Yeah, well, um, I wanted to conduct a research project. I mean, Reed had all these principles, uh, but I wanted to conduct a research project to see what was really going on. And of course, because many of Reed's principles are around transparency and farming for dissent, and Reed loves the idea of tensions. He's always talking about tensions, right? Um, he, he was really eager also that when we wrote the book that it would show both what, we were, what he was going for and then the wins and also the things that didn't work out so well in the organization. So, and then because they have this startling culture of candor in their organization. When I was conducting these interviews with these 200 employees, they were really candid with me about how things played out for them emotionally and you know, gave me lots of stories about what was working and wasn't working. Uh, so that's how that structure came about, right? He would give his principle and then I would come in and say, well, yes, this is exactly what we see. And sometimes these are the things that we're seeing that are a little bit differently, different than you thought, Reed. I, I would love to know early on, um, what for you was the biggest tension point? What, what principle did Reed have that you just said, absolutely not, there is no way this could work in a corporate setting? Yeah, so when I first came across the Netflix culture, it's probably the way that some of our listeners did, which uh, that was through the Netflix culture deck, right, which is this set of 127 slides that Reed released onto the, the internet a number of years ago that have been downloaded now, I think, over 20 million times. Uh, so some of your some of your listeners are, of course, familiar with that. And that was the fir my first my first exposure also uh, one of the slides uh, in that deck is quite provocative and um, I felt quite provoked when I saw it uh, that slide says at Netflix adequate performance gets a generous severance and when I heard that I was um, I was confused because at INSEAD, the business school where I teach, we were focusing a lot on the idea of psychological safety, uh, that if you want to have innovation, you need a psychologically safe environment. But here was a company that was not looking at psychological safety. <laughs> they were talking instead about, you know, either you're stunning or you're out, right? So I was really puzzled. Like, how could that play out in a, in a company that was so innovative um, while they're still telling their, telling their uh, employees that? And then, you know, there's other very startling things in that in that deck, things that say things like um, at Netflix, our vacation policy is take some and at Netflix, <laughs> our travel policy is act in Netflix's best interest. And I thought that those principles were quite interesting, but how they actually could play out in a real life company, I had a lot of difficulty understanding that. Uh, yeah, so I went in definitely a skeptic. I, I would love to dive into some of these principles here in a minute, but I, I am wondering in terms of how Reed really formulated this type of thinking, right? Like this is really innovative. Um, most of us grow up and we're just kind of programmed almost an industrial revolution and that pyramid scheme in terms of top-down structure, hierarchy. And he kind of took this more of a biological approach in terms of the structure of a tree. And I know you talk about the pyramid versus the tree. I would love to know within your work, how did Reed start to formulate this type of thinking? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, it was really, really clear how it happened for Reed, which is that he had a, a first company, what, what, one that he talks a lot about, uh, about his ex experience opening up a company called Pure Software. And that company, when it started out, it was just a small company, you know, just like a, a regular small entrepreneurial, small group of people who were operating, let's say, fast and loose, right? So there were no rules or process that were guiding the way they behave. They were just using their best judgment uh, to make good decisions for the company as well as they could. But then the company started to grow, right, to a couple of hundred people, a couple thousands of people. And as it grew, some people did stupid stuff and some people took advantage of the freedom that was given to them. Like there was this guy named Jim who used to fly every week from San Francisco to L.A. And because there was no travel policy, he started flying first class, right? Why not? He was more comfortable. And there was this woman named Charlotte, and she used to bring her dog to work every day uh, because there was no policy saying she couldn't. And the dog chewed a big hole in one of the carpets. Uh, so Reed was really frustrated about these expensive mistakes people were making. So he and Patty McCord, the head of HR, sat down and created like this, uh, this extensive employee handbook. And it said things like, you know, you can travel this way and that way, but not this way. And there's no dogs at work. Right. Um, but then a couple of other things started to happen. One is that uh, the really creative, mavericky employees, they started to leave the company. They wanted to go work for places that they could like run free. Right. And so the company stopped innovating. And then the people who were really good at following the rules and process, they were promoted into senior management roles. And then the environment shifted from C++ to Java, but the management were not the most flexible people and the company was unable to shift and Reed had to sell the company. So when he opened Netflix, he had these two kind of like overriding lessons that were driving him. The first one was employee freedom breeds innovation, right? And the second was process kills flexibility. And we can really see that the entire Netflix success story is built on these two simple these two simple uh, lessons that he learned in his first company. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I love how he took that past experience and, and really readapted um, how he views everything, and then more importantly, how he actually proceeds with it. Uh, I am wondering though. You, you've done so much research into this. Are there certain industries or even size of companies that you think if they were the leader of this company, this might not be the best system for them? Yeah, so um, I mean, my biggest lesson from this whole thing is that most company cultures were set up for the industrial era and that they are operating with this kind of like industrial hangover. Yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, what I mean by that is that during the industrial era, which of course powered, you know, the, our, the, our most successful economies for over 300 years, right? So of course, we learn these methods well, but the industrial revolution was all about error prevention, right? Replicability and consistency. Because if you are running an industrial plant, those are the things you need every product to be exactly the same, right? No errors. But in today's creative era, in our information age, there are many more companies and areas of companies that are focused not primarily on error prevention, but instead primarily on fresh thinking and, and innovation and flexibility. So I think that's really kind of the lesson uh, then, then from the book or, or for the readers is that if you are are running a manufacturing plant, don't read this book. <laughs> if you are working in a safety critical environment where your goal is to make sure no one gets hurt, rules and process are your friends, right? Um, but if you're working in a creative area, if you're going for innovation and you can have some small mistakes along the way, then we really need to get out of this industrial way of thinking and recognize, you know, the world has moved on, yeah. right? I, I am 100% on board with that um, for the right environment, of course. How, how do you weigh that in terms of size of company? Does that have any impact? Or if, it, if it's in a space where innovation is key, it doesn't matter the size of the company, you can implement a lot of these principles? 
Yeah, I think they can be implemented in any size of any company, but I do think that some companies have some of both, right? So like a couple of weeks ago, I was with Michelin tires, right? And obviously Michelin tires is a, a safety critical product, right? Yeah. So you want your What's tires to have mistakes, right? So it's a safety critical industry. Um, they, they produce, they manufacture tires, right? So consistency and replicability. So throughout a lot of that company, they're really going for error prevention. But there are others areas of the company that are really focused on innovation. And I think that these principles can be applied, you know, to a part of a company. I think that we can say in this department, we're going to use the principles from no rules rules. And in this part, we're going to stick to our, uh, to our industrial era ways. Yeah, uh, it's funny. And that, that was reminding me, I came across um, NASA had an offsite. Um, they have like a hundred page document about this. And you, you want to talk about, you have no margin for error in terms of what they're building, what they're doing. But they were taking a lot of these principles that were actually instilled within Netflix in terms of innovation, creative thinking, and implementing them. So there you've kind of got that, that two tiered system you're talking about. You have that, you, you need strict policies in some regard for safety, but then also that creative innovation. We know that's where everything's going. That's where the future needs to be taken part in. Um, so, so I love hearing about that. One thing I'm so deeply curious about is talent density. And I would love for you to subscribe to the listeners what talent density is. And I want to dive into some of the details on it. Yeah, so um, talent density is based on uh, the rock star principle. So uh, the rock star principle is actually uh, based on research that was done with software engineers in the 60s. But this research showed that if you had one like really amazing software engineer, just the best, right? That this person could deliver 10 to 25 times the value of an average software engineer. So if you have a pool of money, you have a choice. You could hire 10 or 25 like medium engineers, or you could hire one rock star and pay her like a rock star. Right. Um, so the idea at Netflix is that on a team, you'd you want to have all rock stars. So you want less people who are paid more. And then in doing so, you have more of what they call high talent density, which means uh, that, that well, the talent is really dense right on the team. So I, I love that. I, I would love to know just with the amount that you've done, not only within Netflix, but other companies, what have you seen of the highest performers across different industries? Are the commonalities you've come across? Well, I think that all sorts of of types of people can be high performers. And that's one of the things, I mean, this isn't about minimizing diversity. You might find that on your team, one person is like the best in the company at building team relationships and that might deliver a lot of value, right? Um, but at Netflix, they say something that's quite um, controversial and that is adequate performance gets a generous severance, right? So the idea is that if you have eight rock stars and two medium employees, then you don't want to keep the medium employees, you need to move them off for other rock to make room for other rock stars. And the reason that is, is because of this idea that performance is contagious, right? So a lot of people think about an individual performance problem as an individual problem, but it's not, a, it's a systemic problem. There's this, uh, this fascinating study uh, by a, a colleague of mine in another business school, this guy named Professor, uh, Professor William Phelps, right? And the study that he has, he invites um, four MBA students into his lab at a time. He gives them a 45 minute task and he rewards them financially based on how well they perform. But unbeknownst to them, on half of the teams, there's an interloper, right? And this interloper, he's this actor named Nick. And he's been hired to act just like a regular MBA student, but to do some things that are a little bit undesirable right? A little unamazing. So sometimes he acts kind of bored, like he puts his feet up on the desk or he texts his girlfriend, right? Sometimes he acts kind of jerky, like he might say things to someone else on the team, like, have you ever attended a business school class before? Right? <laughs> uh, and what's so interesting is that, you know, on team after team after team, Professor Phelps showed that um, those teams that had uh, had Nick on them performed at a 45 percent uh, worse rate, even when the other three MBA students were amazing. 
And what's super interesting is that you can see his behavior bleeding over onto theirs. Mm -hmm. So for example, when he acts bored, they all get bored, right? There's this one video where he's acting bored and one of the other MBA students puts her head down on the table looking exhausted. And when he acts jerky, the other MBA students start to act jerky too, not just to him, but to one another. Right. So here we can really see why adequate performance needs a generous severance, because the best indicator of how well a team will perform is not the top performer on the team or even the medium performer on the team. It's the lowest performer on the team who kind of, let's say, uh, drags the team down. So that's what we see in these teams at Netflix is these, these teams of all top performers that aren't getting dragged down, but are instead spiraling up. I love that. And it's just so interesting. We'll, we'll link that research study up and I, I want to see that video. I've not seen the board video with the head down. So really interested in checking that one out. H how does this in terms of when, when you have this high talent density, but you have one of these low performers, how quickly internally at Netflix, are they quickly assessing this person and then getting them out of the system? Yeah, well, there. first I should say there is no process, right? Which okay, is, yep. which is uh, the, what I say over and over again. I mean, that's the whole thing about the yeah. book. There is no process, right? So there's no rule about when it has to happen or how it has to happen, but there is, um, there is a principle. And the principle is called the keeper test. And the keeper test means that on an ongoing basis, uh, the manager should do, do a, an individual exercise where she may imagine that um, one day everybody on her team is coming to her and saying that they're leaving the company. So maybe one day I have um, Rick who comes to me and Rick says, you know, boss, I'm sorry, I I'm leaving the company. I have another job. You know, how am I going to feel? Uh, am I going to be devastated? Am I going to say, no, Rick, don't leave. Right? Am I going to fight hard to keep him? Well, if I know, if I will, then I know he's the right person for that spot. He's a keeper, right? Mm -hmm. um, am I going to feel a little bit relieved? Am I going to feel a little bit excited, like thinking about who I could get in that position now that I have that spot open? Um, and if so, then you have to ask yourself a couple more questions. Have I given candid feedback? Have I told Rick clearly what he needs to do in order to improve his performance? If I haven't, I better go do it now. But if I have, if I've been doing it repeatedly and I still would be excited if he told me he was leaving, I mean, that's a clear indication he's not a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this guy, he's like Nick, the actor, he must be removed. <laughs> so it sounds a little bit harsh, but I do, um, I do think that just doing this exercise with yourself as a manager, it gives you a lot of clarity about who's, who should be on your team and who you should think about trying to replace. I, I love that. And use the word clarity there. It, it is so true. It's, it's a simple exercise, but it prof provides profound clarity. I, I use this when hiring prior and thinking about if our biggest competitor was to, were to hire this person, how would we feel about missing out on them? Um, so so I, I love the keeper test there. It, it, it's so funny. You're mentioning about feedback and things like that. Um, and I know you and I both enjoy uh, a Japanese saying, I might mispronounce this, but it's Kuko Yomi. And I, you have a great story about this and kind of just getting some feedback and then understanding the culture differences, which you're hitting on. I would love for you to touch on this story. Yes. Yeah, so the word is kuki yomenai. They shorten it, the Japanese shorten it to KY. And it means someone who is unable to read the air or someone who is unable to pick up those subtle messages in the atmosphere. I love that idea uh, that's like, so Japanese, right? Of like, picking up messages without even saying them, right? Or say, uh, passing messages without even saying them. So um, I had this experience. My first book, The Culture Map, talks about this principle. And after I finished that book in uh, May 2014, I was feeling really proud of myself. I thought I'd really accomplished something. I sent the book off to the publisher. And then I had this, uh, this humility lesson when I took a, a, a an airplane the next day to Tokyo. And when I was in Japan, I gave a 20 minute presentation to a group of 30 Japanese. At the end, I asked if there were any questions and no one raised their hand. So I went to sit down. My Japanese colleague who was traveling with me from INSEAD said, Erin, I think there were some questions. Can I try? 
And I said, well, sure. So he stood up and he said to the group, Professor Meyer has just spoken with you. Do you have any questions? No one raised their hand. But this time he stopped and he silently observed the audience, right? Like this. And then after 30 seconds, he gestured to a gentleman who was sitting there from my perspective, motionless. And he said, do you have a question? And this guy said, well, thank you very much. I do. And he asked a fascinating question. He did it three more times. So at the end, I said to my colleague, you know, how did you know that those people had questions? And he thought about it. He said, well, it had to do with how bright their eyes were. And I thought, wow, you know, for me coming from Minnesota, like I do, that is really challenging. But then he clarified, he said, well, you know, Aaron, in Japan, we don't make as much direct eye contact as you do in the West. So when you asked the group if there were any questions, most people were not looking right at you. They were looking somewhere else. But I noticed there were a couple of people in the room who were really looking right at you and their eyes were bright, which symbolizes that they would be happy to have you call on them if you would like to. Okay, so the next day I gave another presentation. Again, I asked if there were any questions. Again, no one raised their hand, but that time I just wanted to try. So I did what he suggested. I stopped and I just silently for about one minute, I just silently observed the room. And as I did that, I saw immediately he was right. People were not looking at me. And there was this one woman in the room who was like looking like right in my eyes, right? Now, were her eyes bright? I don't know. But I thought, well, maybe that's the, the signal. <laughs> so um, I made a, just a small gesture to her and she like kind of, you know, I, I was hesitant, but I gestured to her and she nodded her head. And I said, do you have a question? She said, thank you. And she asked a fascinating question. It was such an important learning experience for me because at NCI where I teach, we have, I teach these classes with completely multicultural uh, participants every day. And I saw when I got back there that there were all of these bright eyes in my classes that I had just been entirely missing and not just from the Japanese. Yeah, so that's my lesson about reading the air. <laughs> no, no I, I love that story. And I think so many of us can step back for a minute and say, when, when are those moments that we're missing out and we think no one has their hand raised, but everyone there does. Are, this could put you on the spot slightly. I'm wondering, are there any of these, and we can just call them paradigm type shift moments throughout your career where it was just a real eye-opening experience for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, all the time, but let's see, what are some <laughs> of the other big ones, if I can think of one? Um, yeah, well, let's go back to Netflix. So um, at Netflix, let's talk about candor. There you go, since you brought up Cookie Yom and I. <laughs> so, um, I mean, one of the, actually, you asked me earlier what I didn't like about the Netflix culture when I first got started. And it actually, that adequate performance got gets a generous severance. I found that kind of unsettling, but I didn't really dislike it. What I did dislike was the idea of people giving lots of candid feedback to one another throughout the day. Now, I realize that's probably just my own personality, but I really thought that sounds like a very unpleasant way to work. Why would you want that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I had this situation where I was giving a presentation at Netflix before we started writing the book. And I um, I was had about 500 people in the audience, right? And at one point I came down from the stage, I gave the audience a small group assignment, right? I came down from the stage and I was walking around. And there was one woman in the room who was, um, was talking to her small group and she was gesturing like dramatically, right? And when I looked at her, uh, she noticed me and she, she, she gestured me over. So I came over and she said, um, Aaron, you know, the way that you are managing the discussion from the stage is undermining your point because here you're talking about cultural diversity, but you're asking for volunteers and it's only the Americans who have been raising their hand, right? So I'm really concerned this is going to ruin your presentation. You know, please find a way to fix it. Right? Um, and I was, I was shocked. Yeah. I was shocked. Never before had someone given me feedback right in the middle of a keynote in front of the of a group of other participants. But I also had this like quick kind of moment of, well, of course she's right. How did I not think of that? 
And I had about two minutes before I needed to go back on stage. And I went kind of like into this deep meditative state, right? And I quickly came up with another way for facilitating the interaction so that we got more cultural diversity, right? And I have to say, she saved my presentation. So I think we can really see here the the whole, um, all of the attributes of having a candid work environment. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes the receiver doesn't like it. But if it's done with positive intent, it's almost always helpful. I mean, I didn't feel good about getting that feedback, but it clearly was super useful, not just to me, but all 500 people in the audience. Yeah, it's, it seems like a lot of the time, the most helpful bits of advice were, were painful truths to begin with. So I am wondering, are there just certain people, and this could pertain to Netflix uh, specifically, who just, they, they never are open to hearing that feedback. And maybe they're not the high performers they want anyway. But I, I guess I'm just wondering internally within the culture, are certain people just unwilling to accept those hard truths and, and those people we need to cycle out? Oh, well, sure. I mean, it, um, most people have difficulty receiving feedback, yeah. even people who talk a lot about wanting it. And, you know, that's, of course, because of the amygdala. So, so the amygdala, that's the, your most primitive part of your brain, right? And the amygdala um, is very concerned with finding safety in numbers. So it's looking for signals that you might be kicked out of the tribe, which of course historically would mean death for a human being, right? So when you give me, like Sean, if you decide to tell me that you don't like something about my work or you think I could do a better job with something, my amygdala starts sending off alarms, right? And the alarms are, you're gonna be rejected, right? You're gonna be kicked out of the group. And then my natural physical reaction is of course, fight or flight, right? Either I defend myself, no, Sean, you're wrong, right? I defend myself, or I say thank you, and then I never want to talk to you again. Right? That's the point. Right? <laughs> um, so, so what they do at Netflix? I mean, of course, they have people like this, right? And some people just can't. You know, some people, the, the ones who really defend themselves and really can't like remove the amygdala alarms enough to say thank you when they get feedback. <laughs> um, those people, yeah, you can't you can't survive in those environments. But what they do at Netflix that I thought is really interesting is that they have these system. Um, these uh, yeah, methods that they use in order to make sure that the feedback back gets out there. So um, it's very common at Netflix to have feedback on the agenda. So maybe if we meet, you know, every month and we're colleagues, um, we put it as the last, the last thing on the agenda that you give me some feedback and I give you some feedback. And they also do these crazy things at Netflix. I was really startled when I first heard about them, uh, which is what they call 360 live, live 360 dinners. And a live 360 dinner means that we get together, like the team, right, over a meal. And during that meal, we all give one another feedback. So I'm up first and we go around and everyone at the table tells me something they think I could do in order to improve my performance. And then we move on to the, first, the next person. When I first heard about that, I thought, well, what would be the point? I mean, that's like public shaming. <laughs> we all know, you know, praise in public and criticize in private. But I saw it created this incredible mechanism for creating higher performance for performing teams, which is that um, when you uh, when when one person gives you feedback, you never really know is it about that person or me. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we're in a group like that, I can start seeing, oh, this is just one person, whereas this is a theme of something that I need to work on. Plus, it gets rid of all that whispering and backstabbing that happens on most teams. It's all out there. Right. She's working on this and he's working on that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually started using these mechanisms on my own team. I, I recommend them. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, we're here at the end of the year right now. Yesterday was just filled for me uh, with end of the year performance reviews, things like that. But I, I love this. And it's, it's always great pouring a nice bottle of wine with everyone kind of eating some food. So it doesn't doesn't hurt to add that. I would love, love to dive back a second ago. You were talking about the presentation you were giving at Netflix in front of 500 people receiving that feedback that would, would startle most people and completely ruin um, their talk going forward. So I am wondering, you said you kind of just entered this meditative state. What, what else in the moment do you think allowed you to keep your composure? I know this is a bit nuanced, but I'm really intrigued by that because throughout the day, throughout, throughout our lives, we're going to be faced with these moments that can knock us off during important times. So I'm wondering how you handled that best. Well, um, I mean, I, 
I guess everyone finds themselves in positions like that where they are on the spot and something doesn't go the way that they want it to. And you always have two, uh, two choices of reactions. One is that you can, uh, you can let the feedback like stomp you down or the moment pull you, uh, pull you to the ground, or you can just focus on what you need to do in order to get it done. I mean, I don't have any magic bullet. I really don't. I, all I know is that I remember she gave me the feedback and I, my first thought was, are you kidding me? And then about five seconds later, I thought, Erin, you better think like crazy because you're going back on stage in two and a half minutes and she's right. Right. And of course, when we have time pressure, it, it allows us to be extra focused. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have anything to say beyond that. Yeah, I didn't know. I, I thought it'd be interesting to, to see. Uh, I would love to dive back in and you, you talk about that, that no vacation policy, essentially. How is that reinforced? Yeah, so um, at Netflix. OK, so the whole idea at Netflix is that if you have a, a bunch of high performers, right, so talent density, and then you have a lot of candor where people are giving one another a lot of feedback, if you have those two things in place, then you can remove most rules and process, right? Then you can give employees huge amounts of freedom. And that freedom goes into a few different kinds of categories. And the first category is largely symbolic which is policies, right? So um, the expense and travel policy at Netflix are um, acting Netflix's best interest. Uh, the maternity leave policy at Netflix is do what's best for you and your baby. And then the vacation policy at Netflix is take some, right? Um, so um, a lot of people are concerned. And, you know, I was concerned also, like, what happens if you don't give people an allotted amount of, uh, of vacation policy? Either they start working all the time and they don't dare take vacation, um, or maybe they go on vacation all the time. Right? Um, but of course, that's very simplistic because... What actually happens is that when you, in the absence of explicit rules, people look around the office for guidelines as to other how others are behaving, right? So if I see, well, most people in the office take about six weeks vacation, then I know I can take about six weeks vacation. <laughs> if I see people are taking no vacation, then I'm not gonna take any vacation either. Right. Um, so that's, I mean, the first thing is just a clearly modeling. So Reed, for example, takes six weeks of vacation uh, every year, and he talks a lot about his vacation. I mean, I've never met a CEO who talks so much about his time being on vacation. Uh, but he does that, he does that purposefully because he knows that since they don't have a vacation policy in the organization, that if he, um, if he takes a only a little vacation, then no one else in the organization is going to take it either. And then the other, of course, is setting context. So at Netflix, they say lead with context, not control. And lead with context, not control just means that you as the boss need to explain to your team what your expectations are of them. Not how many days they can take off, but you know uh, what types of things they should keep in mind when they're thinking about whether to take vacation or not vacation. So context becomes the guideline for how people behave. Yeah, you make that really clear too in the book. I think it was around January. Um, the accountants aren't gonna be taking a month off come, come January. So I, that's just a clear example there. One thing I'm really intrigued about, and we talked about the, the talent density is so fascinating to me and having those high performers. And then you said weeding out the weak ones that spirals upwards even more and more. What about just you getting the talent internally, but then also developing that even more? Do they have particular systems in place just to help build that up? <laughs> so, Sean, the answer again is no. there is the project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, it's, it's very interesting because let me just say, and I will come to your question in a moment, but um, most of the processes at most companies, they do not have at Netflix. So there's no management by objective. There's no KPIs. There's no annual bonus reviews, right? And there's no specific, um, no, there's no salary bans. There's no process about how you get promoted or don't get promoted. So those are the, um, those are the, the, um, the, the wrapping 
in normal companies that creates high levels of efficiency, but also keeps the organization from being flexible when the environment changes, changes around them. So of course, at Netflix, they hope to develop their employees and they seek hard to do that. But there's not like, a, you know, if you take this class and you do this thing and that thing, then you'll get this, right? If there's not like a process that's in place for it. It's more like, you know, individual in mentor, mentoring and one person each person doing doing it in a different way or each manager doing it in a different way. I, I'm intrigued about that. You talk about the mentoring process and I, I know you studied a lot of leaders even before your time with Netflix. How do you think leadership is changing moving forward? Yeah, well, so I'll come back to what you brought up earlier, which is the, the tree versus the pyramid. So um, at most organizations, decision making is like a pyramid, right? So you have the boss at the, the, the top of the pyramid, the chairman, and then you have the lower level employees at the bottom. And of course, the lower level employees, they can make small and expensive decisions. But if they want to make a, if they have a big, a big decision they're dealing with, that has to get pushed up the pyramid, right? So the leader is like the gatekeeper, right? The approver. Um, but if you have great employees, and you have an environment of candor, then maybe you're ready to set up the decision-making process at your company like a tree. And at Netflix, where they say you lead with context, not control, what we have is the chairman who's down there in the earth, right? Who's down there in the dirt with the roots. And um, the chairman is setting the direction for the company. Like, you know, this is our North Star. This is the way we're running and the, 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 the things we need to keep in mind when we're making decisions and, you know, our, our, key, uh, the, our key, key points to remember. And then you've got the senior executives who are like at the, the big branches at the bottom of the tree, setting more context for their departments. But then you have the lower level managers who are like at the outside of the tree, right? And those people, they're the ones making the big expensive decisions, keeping in mind all of the context that's been set throughout the tree for them. The thing is that with a pyramid model, you can only grow so fast, right? I mean, if you think about it, there's a bottleneck at the top, right? But with a tree, the, the potential for speed of growth is unlimited. And I actually think that's incredible when we think about how fast Netflix has grown to recognize if they were a pyramid, I don't think it would be possible. Mm -hmm. So what we can say here, like, what does that mean for the leader? In, in this kind of process, you're not the gatekeeper, you're the gardener, right? Mm -hmm. You're the one there managing the soil, uh, making sure that the light and the, the, the water is there, and then your tree is going to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a beautiful example um, of that growth is with bamboo trees. And I'm pretty sure it's like five years, they, they barely grow at all. And then in that fifth year, it's like 30 feet within eight weeks or something because of the, all the work, the context prior to that. So I, I love that example by you. What else does Reed do that's just, you, you still even step, step back and just kind of think, huh, that still is really unique. But for, for some reason, he's able to pull that off and it, it helps the overall culture at Netflix. Oh, it's clear. What Reed does that is absolutely incredible is that he is ridiculously transparent. Hmm. And it's funny because I don't mean, I'm not talking about feedback. I'm talking about uh, no secrets, <laughs> sharing everything with his employees. So of course, you know, everyone talks about um, organizational transparency. Everyone thinks that's good, but Reed takes it to a startling, startling degree. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there are some things that are like known, which is that, for example, um, Netflix is the only company that I'm aware of that's traded on the stock market where they announce their quarterly uh, results to the employees before they announce them to the, to the market. And most companies don't do that because they know that if the employees leak the messages that then, you know, that that's illegal, right? Um, but at Netflix, they, they really into this, you know, showing trust for the employees and then knowing that that will encourage them to behave responsibly. They've never had a leak up until now.
right? Um, but then these other things happen. Like, <laughs> I mean, when I was writing with Reed, we were right at the beginning and I've written one chapter, but it was just a, you know, a very rough chapter. And I sent it to him for, for him to look at and give me feedback on. And the next week I was doing an interview with a Netflix employee in Amsterdam and he referenced that chapter. And I thought, what? And he said, oh yeah, well, Reed sent that out to all of us. And I was like, wait, he sent you, he sent our, that chapter to everybody. And he said, oh no, just, um, just the top 800 managers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the leadership, the leadership team. Yeah. And I was like, what? You know, it wasn't finished. <laughs> um, but then when I, you know, I, I wanted to complain about it, but when I thought more about it, and as I got to know, read more, I, I saw he just, his knee jerk reaction is you have information, you share it, right? Because then employees see they have all the information they need to make good decisions. No one's hiding anything from me and I should behave responsibly for this organization. And there's another little story, which is that the book was supposed to come out in May, but because of COVID, it was pushed back to, to this September, 2020, right? Um, but Reed, who doesn't like to keep secrets, he uh, sent the manuscript out to all Netflix employees. Right? And he said, please don't share it with anybody. And when it comes out, make sure to pay for it. Yeah. Right? Um, and you know, that's just natural for him. But I can tell you the publisher was not very happy. <laughs> Never before had they had an, uh, an author who had sent the manuscript out to 8,000 people before it was released. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine they wouldn't be too happy there. Luckily, uh, the, the later release certainly doesn't seem to hurt you guys uh, in terms of just the, the amount of the success the book's um, experienced thus far. And I know we'll continue. It's, it's funny, the best books seem to gain traction uh, over time. So I'm hoping the same success there. I, I want to dive into that quarterly earnings. This is this, the best books. There's tension points and you're, you have to wrestle with them for so much. And like I always view things that, that you should never multiply by zero, right? Like what's the thing you're going to do that could be catastrophic? And I, I don't know, there's like the tension point. I'm almost like, I, I understand the trust within the employees, but is that one that the the downside is so dangerous that it, it, it's almost not worth the risk? I would love to know how Reed processes that and, and how you think about it at this point. Well, Reed always says, so of course, I mean, with all of the lack of rules and process, people always say, but what happens when someone abuses it? Yeah. Right. And sometimes people do abuse it. So not that one. But for example, the fact that they have no expense policy, um, they do do annual audits. And there was one employee in Taiwan who had spent a hundred and a hundred thousand dollars on personal travel, like vacations with his family. And that wasn't caught. I think I can't remember if it was three or four years. Um, and, you know, then he was fired, right? It was caught because of the audit. And he was like, oh, well, he was just waiting for it. He knew it was going to happen sometime, yeah. right? Um, so a lot of leaders, when that happened, they would say, okay, well, we can't do this anymore, right? Now we've got to put in place some expense policies. Um, but Reed always says, you know, if an individual abuses the freedom, don't take away the freedom of everybody else. Just deal with that one case and move on, mm -hmm. right? And that's what he says about these earnings too. You know, he says, well, as we get bigger, certainly at some point, someone is going to leak that information. But when it happens, we're just going to deal with that one individual case. We're not going to, we're not going to take away the, the transparency of the organization just because of, of a few bad apples. No, no, no. That makes perfect sense. Um, and I love that. I love having to explore your own thinking even further. And that's what this book does a lot of. I would love to know, exploring your thinking just a little bit. I know we're going to wrap up here in a minute. What don't you get asked enough about? Well, I mean, I think you've done a great job today, Sean. I have to say what drives me crazy uh, during these interviews is that people always want to talk about the firing without understanding the freedom, right? Um, and I always say, you know, it's like eating your vegetables, right? It's like um, adequate performance gets a generous severance. I mean, that high, that high talent density, some people love it and some people hate it, right? That's your spinach. Um, candor, all of that candid feedback, that's your squash, right? Some people love it and some people hate it. But the thing is, if you eat your spinach and you eat your squash, then you get to eat your cake, 
right? And the cake is all the freedom to make big decisions yourself, to, um, to do what you believe in, even if your boss doesn't think it's a good idea, to not have rules and process tying you down. And everybody loves the cake. Right? <laughs> um, so I think that's really important to think about, you know, if you're a leader on a team uh, and you think, oh, you'd really like to start giving your employees more freedom, then you might really go back and think about, you know, what can I do in order to get a little bit higher talent density here in order to, uh, you know, use the keeper test and try to figure out how to make sure I've got all the right people in the right spot because then I can give them more freedom. And then what can I do to start little by little getting a little bit more candor? Onto the, onto the team, a little bit more feedback, right? And then what's the first couple of rules that I can start getting rid of? And little by little, the cycle of innovation and flexibility takes place. Yeah, you, you hit on the aggregation of those marginal gains there really add up over time. I, I have to tap into this for one second about, say, say we're you're a leader right now trying to add and build that talent density. Is there anything that you've seen or Netflix has done to really spot that talent earlier on, right? Like you mentioned, certain people don't like that environment. I'm wondering if they've come across anything to help with that. Yeah, well, I think the most important thing at Netflix is that they publicize their culture. Yeah, <laughs> work there. that's helpful. <laughs> but I mean, really, I actually had one manager who said to me that she thought the entire reason that Netflix had been so successful was because they published adequate performance gets a generous severance and they talk about it during the interview process. So the people who come to work at Netflix are already risk takers because anyone who's focused on security and minimizing risk doesn't want to work in an environment where they say adequate performance gets a generous severance. Yeah. So they then just naturally get a, a group of employees who are all comfortable, you know, kind of turning away from error prevention and trying out new things uh, because of that strong risk orientation. Maybe that in itself uh, can help. Yeah, no, that's, that's very helpful, very clear. Aaron, this, is, this has been so much fun. Uh, before we wrap up here in a minute, I would love to know, though, if you could sit down with anyone, not a family member, dead or alive, and just sit down, interview them for an evening, who would that be? Oh, people always ask me that question. I don't think I have a good answer. <laughs> I probably need to come up with something. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sean. I'm out of ideas. No, no, no problem at all. Um, so, Aaron, I know, I know we hit on a ton here about the new book. Anything else you want to leave listeners with? Um, of course, we're going to link it up. Just, just any lasting parts here? Nope. Um, it was a, a great pleasure to be with you today, Sean. A great pleasure to be with your audience. And um, I hope that they enjoy the book. Please join me on LinkedIn at my website, AaronMeyer.com. And I hope to meet all of you face to face the next time. Yeah. And guys, for watching the video, the book is right there. Um, really in cover there. No rules, rules, Netflix and the culture of reinvention. You're Aaron Meyer. This was an awesome conversation. So thanks so much for joining us on What Got You There. Thanks, Sean. Got you there with Sean Delaney. Got you there with Sean Delaney.